Hello, I'm Cheryl Thorman with the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction, uh, the speech and language consultant for the department. And today we'll be talking to staff in the Wheatland Center School District regarding the use of paraprofessional support in their speech and language program. As the profession of speech and language moves from a single service provider to a multi-level of service providers, We'll hear today about the use of paraprofessional support in the district speech and language program. We'll be utilizing a question and answer format to a panel comprised of school district staff. I'd like to start by introducing our panel participants. We have Tricia Herzog, uh, paraprofessional, Sue Fell, Director of Special Education, and Mary McBurney, speech language pathologist. So what I'm going to do I'll just start with the questions, and we'll just let folks answer, and we'll just keep going back. We're in, in the school. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start with the first question, and uh, anyone who wants, feel free to uh, answer any, or anyone who wants, anyone who wants to add on something can do so. So the first question, how long has the district utilized a paraprofessional to provide support in the speech and language program? Um, we began using a speech and language paraeducator in the 1996-1997 school year. Um, we were part of the DPI pilot program at that time. It's been about 15 years, about 15 years. Okay. Wow. Um, how many speech language pathologists are in your district and how many paraprofessionals are used in support of the speech language program? There's only been one speech and language pathologist in the district full time, and the paraprofessional position has gone is at 20 percent right now, one day a week. And then, in addition to that, I work between two schools. As far as I know, I'm the only in our consortium the only paraprofessional that works speech and language. And how? What percentage do you work in the district? I am 50 percent of the other district. So, total seventy. Okay. Uh, please describe some of the activities or duties a paraprofessional carries out to support the speech and language pathologist. Talk about some of the duties you have, and anything you want to add. Yeah. Um, over the years, we started um, with, as Mary referenced before, the pilot program that we did. Um, it really gave some very specific bullet points, if you will, on what I what I was able to do and what I what was out of my scope. And part of my things are some clerical, um, assisting um, Mary with any you know materials, prepping things for the for the sessions with the students. Um, some Mary also has usually would give me some direct instruction on working one to one, kind of some carryover skills. Okay, in addition to that, though, while Tricia would be working with the student, we also asked her to, you know, record and chart um, data relative to the student's progress. Um, and also sometimes monitoring carryover skills in the Gen Ed program as well. Right. Um, what would you say some of the duties or activities are outside of the paraprofessional scope of responsibility? Again, we did take our original directive from the pilot program, but first and foremost, I think, would be administering or interpreting any evaluation measures, um, developing or modifying IEPs, working with a student outside of the scope of the IEP, goals themselves, um, I suppose signing anything that related to the evaluation process, any type of legal document, um, and probably also uh, conferencing maybe with um, students, parents, staff, specifically regarding you know the disability and their needs. Yeah, I usually would just refer to you know if it's. Um, in passing, if there was a parent who had a question, I would listen and, you know, you should say, well, I'll, you know, pass this That's information so along <laughs> to the proper person. <laughs> and from there, we do always tell. Okay. 
So this kind of follows with some of the others, which is basically how do you determine which duties can perform, be, be performed by the paraprofessional. I think it kind of comes from us, from what we just said, and then from us just kind of conferencing with each other. Um, you know, over the years, you know, we're in a K-8 school, so some kids, you know, when they've been for a few years, there's a little bit less that Mary would have to tell me, you know, just from being, knowing the students and working with them over the years. But usually any, before, like, or any testing that was done, you would kind of tell me where the students were at, um, what else, after, maybe after IEP meetings and things have changed, if any of their goals have changed. Parent-teacher conferences, maybe some parent right. concerns that come up. Yep, mm -hmm. teacher concerns, anything like that, yeah. Um, what type of supervision does a paraprofessional work under? Um, as far as supervision, I would say it would be direct and indirect. Direct supervision um, would include actually observing what well, Trish is implementing um, the speech and language plan, including, you know, the recording of data that we talked about, and just observing her interactions with the students parents and the teachers. Um, indirect supervision would involve um, more of what Trisha was just referring to, the discussion of the student goals and um, what kind of materials we would use to work on providing the reinforcement for their skills. Changes in the daily schedule, um, anything that we wanted her to complete to help with the program, whether it's clerical or making you know, materials things like that. Notes, we do it through sometimes face-to-face, -face, like I said, sometimes through notes back and forth, whether they're notes in the student log or whether they're just notes that <laughs> we would leave to each other. Yeah. Right. 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 And I think that comes as uh, one of the other questions we were talking about, the on, you know, the ongoing communication that you have between the therapist and the paraprofessional. And we often schedule time minimally once a week, so, you know, nothing else interfered with that time. So if Trisha had concerns or questions or I had things I felt we needed to discuss, we would make sure that we did that. Right. Um, what do you think makes good teamwork between the, the both of you as a paraprofessional and speech pathologist? Well, I mean, we've worked together for so many years, and when this <laughs> question was posed, I, I, it's just kind of like, well, I don't know, it, you know, you can almost like finish each other's sentences at certain times. Um, but we really have always had a very, just a real open communication, and we've always really, we've really gotten along very well, so that's something that helps. Um, you know, we just, we just take notes, and if you're on a lot of respect, or yeah. a real clear role definition too, yeah. and I think that that adds to that. Right, right. Just role yeah. definition. I think respect yeah. for each other yeah. as right. professional. Yeah. And I think the shared background knowledge that we discussed, because Tricia, you know, has a very good background yeah. having her bachelor's degree in communication yeah. disorder. Yeah. So yeah. when you're both using the same vocabulary, it makes everything. You know, right. She doesn't have to stop and explain what. Yeah, You know, that kind of leads into one of the other questions I had that, um, can you describe how training or in-service is provided? And I would say, I mean, more prepared professional or the new thing to be an in-service. Well, we include training. Trisha in any of our in-service mm -hmm. thing we do in the consortium, you know, just like we would everyone else. If we have a speech and language meeting, I would also include Trisha in that. Um, she would. She is open to attend anything she would wish to. You know, that would certainly be. You know, very supportive of anything she'd want to go to. We've also mm -hmm. done some, um, like some other in-service things. Oh yeah, you've had Together. a lot. Of, Trisha's had a lot of training. Um, you know, she's participated in the autism state training, wow. which were great. Yeah. You know, we've done PEX training together. Um, we attended other in-services together. You know, some of the more some of the more recent ones are like Motor She Speaks or maybe an oral motor mm -hmm. in service with Pam Marcella. Mm -hmm. um, but also district in services that are provided as well. Um, in addition to the consortium special ed ones. 
also if they did a non-crisis violence tr crisis intervention training, Trisha did that yeah. as well. Yeah, so and then it's nice to, it was always nice when we did those together oh, yeah. because oftentimes it's like, what did, you know, oh no, I think she said this, and like it, even just having the background knowledge of it, it was always very, um, we would come back very excited because, you know, yeah. we would see somebody and go, oh, that had really worked with so and so, and come back, and we were ready to go. Well, so it sounds like a very good working relationship. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, let's see. So, as a speech therapist, then, are there activities you can dedicate more time to because of the paraprofessional support? Oh, I'm sure there are some. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any you can describe? Maybe evaluation? Um, by, you know, ha by having Tricia here at set time, depending upon how we did scheduling, it would allow for many of their functions. Sometimes it would allow for parent training or just consulting with parents. It would allow for staff training or consulting with them about a specific student in their caseload. Um, it allowed time to do some research on a specific need in our disability area that we didn't normally have time to do. Um, Trisha was also very helpful to me in learning technology. <laughs> <laughs> you know, working on school committees, any number of things. Um, we would, for example, one year when Trisha was here, we did scheduling classes for myself during that time, and I would use that as you said, for evaluation or due process. But that doesn't always stay, you know, free the entire mm -hmm. year, depending sure. on how sure. hard things work out. Yeah, right, great. All right, let's see, well, let's go, I guess, then, just if any of you want to, you know, which one just want to talk about how you feel these support personnel and the speech and language program is working for you. So I guess I would say that um, we've done for so many years and I think that we've arranged it in such a way that it is a mutual benefit. And I think it benefits the kids, I think it benefits the families, um, I think it benefits the school district and the therapist and the paraeducator. I think there's a benefit to everyone by doing it this way. And the way we do it is we don't take away any of the student service time. You know, the student has their IEP required service time but we break that into um, a piece where they're provided direct therapy with therapists and then a reinforcement session with four or two, however many we need, with the peer educator. And so I think it benefits the kids greatly. What's your Anything else? No, I just think to reinforce what Sue said, the primary objective for us was to allow for the kids not to lose any therapy time. And by having, by being able to schedule um, Trisha's time, we schedule time with students first and the other activities second. All right. Um, how have you, you talked about parents, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, kids getting their service. How have you informed parents about the service delivery using paraprofessional support and what has been their reaction? Uh, Various methods have been utilized uh, throughout the years, including, for example, a letter home at the beginning of the year, introducing both of ourselves, giving a little bit of background information about ourselves and our program here at the school, um, posting on the school webpage. Again, that same kind of information. Um, discussion with parents of the service model at placement needs, uh, IEP needs, parents, teacher conferences, mm -hmm. um, often, you know, when we would bring up that I would see them, let's say there's a student who you're going to see twice a week for a total of 60 minutes, and I would indicate to them that I would see them one time a week and that uh, Trisha would see them the second time a week, and then they would, they would ask questions, always. Um, but I think, as, and they might be a little hesitant at first, mm -hmm. but it really didn't take long before they really bought into it. And I think they were, for the most part, happy to get that additional time, the additional therapy. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, and that, once again, also goes back to the, you know, um, you know having a bachelor's degree and, and being aware of what things are, I think maybe also mm -hmm. was very helpful. Yeah. And they
being able to implement the, the goals in there. Um, so, these are really my questions. I don't know if there's anything else anyone on the panel wanted to add before we conclude. Any last statements or anything maybe that I've missed that you would like to share? Or maybe we covered it. I think we may have covered it. Okay. I just think it's been an excellent program for our district. You know, as we said before, it's allowed for a lot of flexibility in scheduling students for therapy, managing speech and language workload, um, and just an overall greater consistency of services so that mm -hmm. sessions did not need to be canceled because of other due process requirements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds like it. Sounds like it. Well, I'd like to thank Trisha, Sue, and Mary uh, for their participation on this panel. Uh, we hope this discussion will be helpful to other districts who may be looking into the use of paraprofessional uh, support in the speech and language program. I'll say thank you again. And this concludes our panel discussion. Thank you.